Oh, thank you. So, good afternoon. Um, oh, thank you. Call and response. I love it. Um, <laughs> My name is Jody Ann Francis, and I am the Associate Director of the Black Studies Program here at the City College of New York, and will serve as your moderator tonight for this symposium. Um, first, I want to thank you, um, each of you, for being here today. We do not take this lightly that we're in this like new normal, and that you could be anywhere in the world, but yet you have chosen to be here sharing space and celebrating this momentous occasion with us. For that, we sincerely thank all of you. I also want to mention, um, if they're in the audience, um, and acknowledge President Boudreau, Provost Liss, Associate Provost of Community Engagement, Vanessa K. Valdez, and our director, and also our lovely advisory board um, for the Langston Hughes Festival. In addition, I want to thank my panelists, <laughs> who are amazing, um, Lori Woodard, Kiera Alegria, Hudes, and Caitlin Greenwich. <laughs> so if you're new to City College, we apologize for the steep hills, <laughs> and we welcome you to Hamilton Heights. And if you are returning, just left your office, or you are in between classes, or you're an alum, it's really great to see you. Today marks the 44th iteration of the Langston Hughes Festival. Today is a day-long celebration where we intend to honor Langston Hughes' legacy by inducting our 2023 medallion winner, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, Lynn Nottage. bringing Langston Hughes here into this space by reading an excerpt of Hughes's poem, Freedom's, Freedom's Plow. When a man starts out with nothing, when a man starts out with his hands empty but clean, when a man starts to build a world, he starts first with himself and the faith that it is in his heart, the strength there, the will there to build, First in the heart is the dream, then the mind starts seeking a way. His eyes look out onto the world, on the great wooded world, on the rich soil of the world, on the rivers of the world. The eyes see materials for building, see the difficulties too, and the obstacles. The mind seeks a way to overcome these obstacles. The hand seeks tools to cut the wood, to till the soil and harness the power of the waters. Then the hand seeks other hands to help, a community of hands to help. Thus the dream becomes not one man's dream alone, but a community dream. Not my dream alone, but our dream. Not my world alone, but your world and my world belonging to all the hands who build Langston Hughes. So since I was an undergrad, you know, a um, blank amount of years ago, um, here <laughs> at the City College of New York, um, we English major, I have always been fascinated by entrances and exits how an egress becomes an egress, and vice versa. How a student stumbles their way freshman year into an office, classroom, and then leaves senior year anew. How a professor walks up to a blackboard and refashions its topography to serve as a muse. How a space or geography becomes defined, becomes fertile ground, and becomes an extension of and response to the humans who fill it. And finally, how storytellers enter their work at the intersection of time and space to reveal truths 
make the unseen seen, to make silent dreams and whispers audible. In Professor Nottage's interview with President Boudreau, she stated, I think that if I want to disrupt anything, it's the notion of who we are as black people and disrupt the notion of us living in some binary universe in which there's only one way to tell our story. She spoke about her entry into the lives of people she interviewed and how many of them, BIPOC, black indigenous people of color, especially black women, felt unheard and unseen. And that many times through storytelling, it helped to listen, to share, and unearth their voices. The care and responsibility of storytellers like Lynn Nottage reminds me of a South African expression of word, Ubuntu. Ubuntu roughly translates to, I am because we are, and because we are, I am. At the core of Ubuntu is what sociological units and groups and interdisciplinary studies like race and ethnic studies, intersectional identities and the humanities, and above all else, storytellers intrinsically understands that an ingress is oftentimes the same as an egress. Langston Hughes concludes his poem, Freedom Plow, with this stanza. A long time ago, an enslaved people heading towards freedom made up a song. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. The plow plowed a new furrow across the field of history. Into that furrow, the freedom seed was dropped. From the seed, a tree grew, is growing, will ever grow. That tree is for everybody. For all America, for all the world, may its branches spread and shelter grow until all races and all peoples know its shade. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. So as you're holding on, <laughs> the Langston Hughes Festival began in 1978 as a dream. And with its first prize, James Baldwin, first prize to James Baldwin, and today we built upon with our own Freedom's Plow by celebrating Hughes' legacy of dreaming with playwright, screenwriter, screenwriter libertist, and 2023 Hughes medalist, Lynn Nottage. What I have received from both Lynn Nottage's work as a storyteller and Langston Hughes' Freedom Plow is that we will find each other at the doorways, at the ingress, and at the egress, as we see each other, hear each other, we create the world and contribute to it at the intersection of where dreams live. Thank you. So we're gonna pivot. Um, I wanna introduce our panelists today a little bit more succinctly. Um, and so I'm going to try to do it justice by actually just reading the bios. <laughs> so um, to my left, immediate left, is Laurie A. Woodard. She is an assistant professor of African American history and black studies. Laurie A. Woodard began her professional life as a dancer with the Dance Theater of Harlem. She completed her BA in history at Columbia University and her PhD, her PhD in history and and African American Studies at Yale University. Her research focuses upon the intersection between the cultural and sociopolitical realms and employs interdisciplinary methodologies, drawing from cultural and political history, biography, critical race theory, performance studies, and women and gender studies. Her work, which has been supported by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, the Mellon Foundation, and PSC CUNY has appeared in the Journal of African American History, the New York Times, and American Quarterly. Her study of the life and work of performing artists and civil and human rights activist Freddie Washington in the work A Real Negro Girl, Freddie Washington and the New Negro Renaissance will be released by Oxford University Press in 2023. 
Dr. Woodard served as a consultant for the Taking the Stage exhibit at the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smithsonian. She's also a member of Governor Kathy Ogle's 400 Years of African American History in the New York State Commission. Lori A. Woodard. In the middle. Um, Kiera Alegria Hudes is a West Philly born and bred language girl. Love that line. Her critically acclaimed memoir, My Broken Language, was recently the Free Library's one book, One Philadelphia Citywide Read. Her Pulitzer Prize winning play, Water by the Spoonful, and Pulitzer finalist play, Elliot, A Soldier's Fugue, explore the diasporican community in Philly and beyond. For the screen, Hudes adapted her Tony Award winning Broadway musical, In the Heights, into a major motion picture and wrote Vivo, an animated feature, both and with collaboration, composer Lin-Manuel Miranda. Her essays have appeared in the Washington Post, The Nation, and most notably, American Theater Magazine, where High Tide of Heartbreak was read widely throughout the theater industry. With her cousin, Hudes founded and runs a prison writing program, Emancipated Story. Originally trained as a composer, Hudes has often written at the intersection of music and drama. She has collaborated with kick-ass musicians, including Nelson Gonzalez, Michelle Camillo, Lin-Manuel Miranda, Aaron McKeon, Alex, Alex Lacamoire, and the Cleveland Orchestra. Kiera Alegria Hudes. Last and certainly not least, um, Caitlin Greenidge. Caitlin Greenidge's debut novel is We Love You, Charlie Freeman, Algonquin Books, one of the New York Times critics' top 10 books of 2016. Her writing has appeared in Vogue, Glamour, The Wall Street Journal, Elle, BuzzFeed, Transition Magazine, Virginia Quarterly Review, The Believer, American Short Fiction, and other places. She is a recipient of fellowships from the Whiting Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University, and the Guggenheim Foundation. She is currently features director at Harbor's Bazaar, as well as a contributing writer for the New York Times. Her second novel, Liberty, is published by Algonquin Books and is out for sale now. Hey, So right now, I'm, we're going to pivot, and I'm going to um, invite our first panelist up, um, Lori A. Woodard. And so I'm just going to go. All right? <laughs> All right, Lori. So thank you, Julianne, Francis, and the Lakes and Hughes Festival. Um, when invited to speak about Lynn Nottage and her impact upon my work, I was literally breathless. The thought of speaking about one of the most important playwrights of the 21st century, one of the most exquisite, persuasive, and effective voices for black women, not only in the United States, but all over the world, was both exhilarating and daunting. Where does one begin to discuss influences that have transformed American theater and impacted the lives of myriad black women. I'm still breathless. Moreover, speaking about one's own work, both in the presence of Lynn Nottage and at an event honoring Lynn Nottage, is a challenging assignment. What exactly is the right balance? How does one align seemingly disparate moving parts? How should one focus the lens? Keeping in mind my uncertainty about the best responses to these questions, I'm going to talk a little bit about the ways in which Lynn Nottage's stunning body of work has influenced my thinking and intersects with the work of performing artist and civil and human rights activist, Freddie Washington. Washington is known predominantly for her interpretation of Piola, the light-skinned African-American woman who chooses to pass for white in the 1934 film Imitation of Life. However, prior to making Imitation of Life, Washington established herself as a serious black dramatic actress on the Broadway stage. 
though working almost a century apart, one as a writer and the other as an actor, the work of Freddie Washington and Lynn Nottage has much in common. Both artists created complex black female characters that were simultaneously courageous, flawed, and self-destructive, yet determined to claim autonomy over their lives. As a performing artist turned scholar, the influence of Ms. Nottage's work upon my understanding of Washington's performances has been subtle, profound, and expansive. I began my professional life not as a researcher or writer, but as a dancer. I discovered Ms. Nottage's plays not on Broadway, but in acting class. As a fledgling actor, her characters were both foreign and deeply personal to me. I worked hard to discern and interpret the distinct objectives and actions of Mamie and Esther in, in intimate apparel, the trauma of Salima and Sophie of Ruined, and the fabulous descent and rise of Undine and Fabulation. I didn't realize it at the time, but it was Mamie, in Mamie, that I found the essence of Suleimé, the character Washington portrayed on Broadway in 1933 in Hall Johnson's play, Run Little Chillin'. As a scholar of 20th century African American women and culture, I see the ways in which Miss Nottage's plays celebrate black humanity in realms that have often long denied it and delve into the extraordinary lives of ordinary black women in all their fragility, power, wickedness, and glory. Speaking to a vast audience, Miss Nottage's works challenge the 20th century trope of the Negro. The operative word in that phrase is not actually Negro. While it may be troubling in the second decade of the 21st century, Negro was the term by which proud black people, like Washington, defined themselves during the first half of the 20th century. Rather, the operative word in the phrase, the Negro, is the the. That is, the idea that dominated 20th century cultural production, black people were both monolithic and largely unchanging. Each time a racialized trope or stereotype was challenged, another one, perhaps less directly offensive and dehumanizing, but equally narrow and limiting, popped up almost immediately. Shackled to the legacy of black-based minstrelsy, during the early 20th century, mainstream cultural producers defined black people as coons and brutes, Jezebels and mammies, and tragic mulattoes. Later, even when Mammy became a matriarch, for example, and mulattoes went upwardly mobile, the representation of black women's identity remained largely one-dimensional and fixed. Throughout, throughout, black writers and actors pushed back, building upon the legacies of the Negro artists who went before them, such as soprano and actress Abby Mitchell and composer, actor, playwright, director, and producer Bob Cole. As playwright and composer, and as leading actress in Run Little Chillin', Hall Johnson and Freddie Washington denied the tropes and limited representations of black women. Before I tell you a little more about Washington and Suleimé, I'd like to talk a little bit about my understanding, my understanding of Mamie and the sort of back to the future way she shaped the under my understanding of Suleimé. Set in New York in 1905, Intimate Apparel tells the story of the very self-sufficient Esther and her largely dignified quest for love as she pursues a long-distance relationship recounted in letters with George, a Barbadian immigrant working on the Panama Canal. Esther is a seamstress, and she has a friendship with Mr. Marx, a Romanian Jewish immigrant and fabric merchant. Her clients include the wealthy white Miss Van Buren, and the talented pianist turned prostitute, Mamie. In Mamie, Ms. Nottage takes the trope of the fallen woman and reveals her courage, resilience, and determination. And yet Mamie is complicated, often getting in her own way. Although in 1905, her profession would have defined her as morally ambiguous, Mamie is loyal and honest and a good friend to Esther. Attempting to heal from the trauma induced by a rigid father, Mamie is also determined to chart her own course. She is aware of the status and places, uh, aware of her status and places a high value on Esther's respect. But she dreams of success as an international concert artist with her own means. Economic independence and being appreciated not only for her physical beauty, but for her talent are central to her. She yearns to be treated like a lady. 
and asserts that she would pay good money for the privilege. And yet Mamie is grounded in the reality of her situation and her confidence is fragile. When Esther scolds her for not taking her dreams seriously enough to turn them into plans or actions, Mamie retorts, you think I ain't tried to make a go of it? You think I just laid down and opened up my legs because it was easy? Additionally, Mamie, unknowingly or knowingly perhaps, perhaps not caring, blinded by her own need to be loved, begins seeing Esther's new husband, George. All three are trapped in the web spun by early 20th century racism that reduced the possibility of their lives to dreams and desperation. Compromised by her profession, though she is not solely responsible, Mamie is also morally, morally ambiguous because she allows her desperation to destroy Esther's hope. Simultaneously honorable and flawed, Mamie is a three-dimensional black woman and fully human. While thinking about Run Little Chillin', I remembered Mamie, who ultimately provided my key to understanding Washington's interpretation of Suleime. It was Mamie's claim to dignity, her need to feel loved and respected, coupled with her willingness to destroy those about whom she cared the most, that I recognized in Washington's portrayal of Suleime. So a little context on uh, Run Little Chillin'. Um, at his inaugural dress on March 4, 1933, Newly elected President Franklin Delano Roosevelt famously assured Americans that all they had to fear was fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzed needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Roosevelt's concern was seeing an anguished nation through the economic crisis of the Great Depression. But American unreasoning, unjustified terror manifested itself in myriad, often contradictory ways. Although not limited to racial concerns, those manifestations included profound anxiety about blackness, which often crystallized into white supremacist fears of racial domination. Within the context of the Great Depression and the Great Migration, the ongoing occupation of Haiti by the United States Marines inflamed consternation and postulation about purported Haitian social, cultural, political, and economic dysfunction that had engulfed the island nation for more than a century. These flames consumed the interests of black and white citizens, media, and cultural producers, often conflating Haiti, the African continent, and blackness. Together, they composed a shifting, complex, and discordant symphony of images and ideas about Haiti and black people. As the site of the Haitian Revolution, the first black republic in the Western Hemisphere loomed large during the New Negro Renaissance, concurrently as evidence of rational black leadership, an icon of black autonomy, and the personification of monstrous blackness. As the Renaissance, the nation, and the world shuddered within the thralls of the Depression and its attendant racial anxiety, for Freddie Washington, 1933 was a year of unprecedented opportunity. Throughout the year, the Haitian occupation exerted a profound influence upon her life insofar as the Haitian imaginary inspired the roles that sent her across the Americas and transformed her career from celebrated dancer to acclaimed dramatic actress and then establishing her as the, a defining face of new Negro womanhood. Engaging concerns surrounding black rationality, spirituality and empowerment, miscegenation, and black women's autonomy, even as they were mired in racialized and gendered tropes and stereotypes, the characters Washington played on the stage and screen during the year reflected black and white cultural producers' complicated interest in Haiti and provided her with the opportunity to hone her craft and grow as an artist. <coughs> Washington joined the cast of Run Little Chillin in the winter of 1933. Despite the centrality of music and singing to the production, which was often dubbed a Negro folk opera, Johnson actually engaged an actress and dancer who did not sing at all as his leading lady. Receiving top billing, Washington was likely cast precisely because she could both act and dance, and because she was beautiful. In the all-black production of an intra-racial story, her skin tone was irrelevant. Run Little Chillin' tells the story of Jim, the married Baptist preacher's son, and his crisis of faith wrought by the arrival of the pilgrims of the new day and the temptations of the free-spirited yet headstrong Suleime. While music, spirituality, and religion are central to the play, Suleime, who occupies much of the thought of the other characters, is at the crux of the narrative. 
Her actions precipitate, drive, and conclude the story. The play begins with a meeting of the members of Hope Baptist Church who are in an uproar because of the arrival of the pilgrims. Their primary concern is the possibility that Jim will leave Hope Baptist and join the pilgrims. The second yet also critical problem is Suleime, with whom Jim is having an affair. The members believe Suleime is responsible for Jim straying towards the pilgrims. Literally born on the wrong side of, of the tracks, according to the members of Hope Baptist, Suleime has a mother like that and no father to speak of. Keenly aware of the opinion the congregation holds of her, like Mamie, Suleime is both desperate to be loved and respected and morally ambiguous. Despite her own respect and admiration for Jim's wife, Ella, Suleime wants a relationship with Jim that does not require sneaking about in the shadows. She's willing to fight for it. At the same time, when she attends a meeting of the pilgrims, she is immediately drawn to the freedom the group offers. Rather than salvation through repentance, the pilgrims celebrate love and joy via dance and music. Things get complicated when Suleime's dance ignites the interests of the leader of the pilgrim's son, Brother Moses. In an effort to win Jim, Suleime attempts to pit Moses and Jim against one another. She is ultimately destroyed because she misuses the only power she has, her beauty and sensuality. Focusing upon Johnson's score, scholarship on Run Little Chillin has largely dismissed Suleime as nothing more than the simplistic bad girl of the production. However, like Mamie, Suleime is a complex, three-dimensional black woman. Building upon the characters written by Johnson, Washington's portrayal of Suleime embraced her contradictions, enabling audiences to empathize and understand the ways in which her circumstances dictated her decisions. Scene by scene, Washington played Suleime's dewy vulnerability, her passion for life and love, her yearning for respect coupled with her fierce claim to freedom and her right to be, to exist in a world that offered little space for a poor black girl. Though she lacked Mamie's talent for the piano and had no domineering father against whom she could rebel, though realized almost 70 years apart, Suleime and Mamie delineated the limitations and celebrated the humanity of real black women. For me, Lynn Nottage and Freddie Washington speak to the profound and critical ways in which art and culture engender feeling and emotion, including joy, fear, anxiety, sympathy, rage, empowerment, and frustration, as well as imagination and inspiration. The characters they created made visible the complexity of black women's identity and the meanings inscribed upon and asserted by their bodies. Enacted before the vast audience of the Broadway stage, their complex beauty issued a potent challenge to white supremacy. They further illuminated the centrality of the performing arts and their ability to influence people's hearts and minds. For while legislation regulates behavior, it is from within the hearts and minds of individuals that the impetus for societal transformation begins. Thank you. That was phenomenal. And I'm nervous to follow it. Um, I prepared, I mentioned to the panelists that I prepared these remarks um, by reconnecting with Lynn's plays, which was a delight. Um, and I read them out loud to myself in my studio yesterday. And so for any students or um, young writers here, or anyone here who's gonna go reconnect with her work after this, may I offer the suggestion of putting, putting those words in your voice, in your mouth, in your body. It was a, a true delight and I had never experienced her work that way. So I'm calling my remarks a soft pen on Lynn Nottage's instructive style. Lynn is an elegant, impressively consistent, and quietly ferocious steward of many communities, many legacies, many stories. She is an activist artist who is deliberate and intentional about the how, why, and what of playwriting. She also happens to be one of the most stylish ladies I know. 
I remember the night I realized this was more than just a writer I revered or a colleague I said hi to. This was an elder in the making with whom I better foster a camaraderie based on respect, curiosity, and skill sharing. You're not an elder yet, Lynn. You have far too much energy. A play of mine was in production at Second Stage, where I believe she sat on the board at the time. She organized a large group of friends and colleagues. There must have been at least 50. Not only to come to the show, but to gather after for dinner, drinks, and discussion, all in support of a playwright they didn't know. Lynn was a mobilizer. She didn't tell me this plan in advance. I found out day of from someone else. It was the ultimate act of generosity, requiring real work on her part, using her cultural capital and organizational resources, and yet she sought no credit, no acknowledgement. A lesson, if ever there was one. Be a steward to the others in your field. Do not hoard the cultural capital you earn over the years, but share it. Let the circle grow. Scarcity mentality has no place here. Over years of lunches, we have checked in on each other's ups and downs. I wish I could report to you on the content of these conversations, but there were delicious writerly secrets shared. <laughs> not the salacious kind, but artistic daydreams and professional doubts. New ideas were whispered about. Lynn, how's that book coming? Insecurities around projects and executions. Anxieties about positionality and the public face of our work. And a dash of gossip. I can't say we know each other's deep souls or the ins and outs of the other's daily life, but I can say these meals over time gave this individual writer energy and morale boosts. We scribes have no centralized office, no water cooler around which to gather. A light lunch between rehearsals, a glass of wine before tech, can foster longevity in an exhausting field. While Lynn's art urges me to contribute to this nation's cultural records, Lynn's lunches remind me that it is humans who make art, that it is mothers and daughters and overworked teachers who must somehow miraculously carve out the hours and do the labor of art making. Over those lunches, I got to know a woman who was funny as hell with a sly, understated humor, a tough cookie who nonetheless felt overwhelmed with many plates spinning and few hours in the day. Now to her work. Lynn's curatorial vision for what a body of work can become over decades of tenacious artistry is unique in our field. So much so that in a, it can eclipse another of her accomplishments. Her style itself, the aesthetic, the line, the music, the singular weft and weave of her craft. So let me talk about that, for her plays have moved me as a craftswoman. This is one damn fine writer. Lynn's plays are built on the sturdiest architecture. These are confidently structured dramas. But I think what makes her aesthetic really dance is the juxtaposition of her soft pen against these solid structures. Her metronome ticks with a gentle, sly rhythm. A soft pen takes trust. Lynn's language is neither flowery nor indulgent, nor does she seduce us with gritty verisimilitude. It's spiritual, her pen. She's tapping in. She knows that bells and whistles are less crucial to her style than the simple flow of human days with droplets of truth mixed in the batter. A sturdy spine, an incredible ear, and a soft pen. Her dramas often climax in whispers rather than roars. Intimate apparel culminates with the quilt stitches, not when they're torn apart, but at the moment, those scraps are fed into the sewing machine to be rejoined. Or this one. In a war-torn village, at a brothel serving militia leaders and government bullies, amidst the ruins of bodies and spirits, as gunfire rages, ruined climaxes with two sotto voce words. I'm ruined. Then, with a hand offered, and that hand received, 
and the timid beginnings of a dance, the story ends. Now this is in a tradition where the long shadows of Oedipus and Romeo loom, where inheritance means eyes poked out their bloody sockets, where love means double suiciding adolescence. This is in a contemporary film and TV context where dramatizing trauma and violence is often mistaking, mistaken for addressing trauma and violence. In truth, the contemporary screen's gritty veritas often replicates wounds rather than offering repair. Meanwhile, Lynn's sturdy architecture allows her to adjust the frame to another softer area of the room. She could have given us an endangered species story by dramatizing a mauled and bloody carcass, but no. Malima, the elephant, stands upright and speaks. In his words, quote, when I was young, I was taught by my grandmother to listen to the night, really listen, for the rains in the distance, listen to the rustling of the brush, for the cries of friend or foe, she'd say you must listen with your entire body, end quote. Words I imagine that could be in Lynn's memoir, for someone who spends her days, therefore her life, writing dialogue, she is actually a listening artist. Back to Ruined. Mama Nadi, before her gentle dance at the end, does have a ferocious speech. Quote, you men kill me. You come in here, drink your beer, take your pleasure, and then want to judge the way I run my business. The front door swings both ways. I don't force anyone's hand. My girls ask them, Emmeline, Maxima, Josephine ask them, they'd rather be here any day than back out there in their villages where they are taken without regard. They're safer with me than in their own homes because this country is picked clean. While men, poets like you, drink beer, eat nuts, and look for some place to disappear. And I am without mercy, is that what you're saying? Because I give them something other than a beggar's cup? I didn't come to this place as Mama Nadi. I found her the same way miners find their wealth in the muck. I stumbled off, that, off of that road without two twigs to start a fire. I turned a basket of sweets and soggy biscuits into a business. I don't give a damn what any of you think. This is my place, Mama Nadi's." End quote. And despite her quieter, more vulnerable words later in the play, I'm ruined, the fact that Mama Nadi then dances shows us She's anything but. Shows us life breaking through the rubble of patriarchal war, and shows us a playwright with faith in tenderness as powers equal. This is womanist world building, and I say that with reverence. This is the proposal a woman warrior makes about how to move forward ethically in a complicated world. Lynn's matriarchal dramaturgy is one antidote to a tradition oversaturated in male violence. It is one antidote to a canon whose scaffolding shakes like a narrow frame of reference that's been built too high. What hope, what instructive wisdom we find in Lynn's body of work, because we, theater makers, nation builders, can take a page from the Lynn Nottage playbook and wield our pens softly and only ever after listening. Wow. Thank you, Kiana and Caitlin. Next up, Caitlin Greenwich. Yes. Um, thank you so much, and uh, those were both such lovely um, words and uh, difficult to follow up. Um, let me start out by saying this is an honor to get to explore Lynn Nottage's work with you today. Nottage is an artist who has been instrumental in my understanding of literature and her unabashed commitment to mining the interior interiority of black women and the seriousness with which she takes the subject has bolstered my own decision to make that subject the center of my life's work. And so I'm gonna to talk to you today about the first work I read of hers, Intimate Apparel, which others have talked about as well. And I hope you'll forgive me for starting this talk with meditating on what it has meant for my own work. 
and it's very rare that as an artist you get to speak directly to the artists who inspire you. Um, so when I first started writing seriously over 15 years ago now, I got a note on my manuscript that has stayed with me for a long time. I'd written the first pages of what would become my first novel, We Love You, Charlie Freeman, um, which is about a black family from Boston in the early 1990s who moved from their black neighborhood to a nearly all-white town in the Berkshires where they take part in an experiment raising a chimpanzee and teaching him sign language. It's a novel in part about the history of scientific racism in the United States, the ways history impresses itself on our present day lives, and the particular claustrophobia of being a black girl in self-proclaimed liberal white spaces. It is in short about a lot, a lot of ideas I spent a lot of time furiously writing down on every stray scrap of paper I could find, stuffing them all down into the bottom of whatever tote bag I happened to be carrying at the moment, thrilled with my own audacity. I knew the novel wasn't for everyone, but I was in love with the ideas that were coming, the questions, and writing down all the things that, at that moment in 2009 America, felt unsayable. It was one of the most exhilarating things I'd ever known. So imagine my surprise when I sat down for a one-on-one -on -one with my writing workshop leader. He liked the novel's ideas. He seemed as excited about their daring as I was, but he said, with a full grin and his deep Australian accent that I will not attempt here, nobody in the story feels anything. There's no emotion on the page. I was aghast. How dare he? How dare this white man? This was a novel about ideas. Who had to actually feel anything? <laughs> but I was nothing if not ambitious. And once I got over myself, I sat down and tracked down how many emotions I had actually written on the page. And they were nearly none. Mostly, my characters were annoyed. <laughs> I did not understand it then, had not made the connection that my characters, the ability to reveal emotional intimacy was deeply entwined with my own personal struggles with emotional compartmentalization. When I was writing those emotionless pages, I was 26 years old. I didn't know how to say it then. The novel project was part of the way of trying to figure out how to say it. But living in my body as a dark-skinned black girl and woman for the previous 25 years had been an exercise in training myself to divorce my body from my emotions. Part of it was family history. I grew up in a family that prized the intellectual, that sparred and teased and quipped, but very rarely discussed personal emotions in detail. And part of it was socialization. I went to all-white schools and non-liberal spaces, places where I could go months without talking and no one would notice. But where the adjectives classmates used the most to describe me were intimidating and regal, both of them so laughably far from my own interior life that I learned to take it for granted that my emotions would always be illegible to the wider world. So I gave up on even the prospect of emotional intimacy, of knowing myself and my emotions on a deep level, or ever, heaven forbid, sharing them with another person. But art necessitates, at a certain point, an engagement with emotion. Even the headiest novels and plays have to have an emotional pulse, no matter how faint or irregular, or else the project falls apart, becomes didactic, essayistic, flat, or hollow. I do not know it then, but if you become an artist, that, but if you become an artist, but are also determined to maintain emotional compartment, compartmentalization, you'll very quickly either destroy your sense of self or your art or both. Compartmentalization, this confusing approach to knowing and understanding intimacy, is baked into the project of Black womanhood. I ground most of how I approach the world and myself in history, and it's part of why I'm so drawn to not just work her meticulous sense of the possibilities and limitations of the archives, her understanding that history is a deeply personal project, present in our grandparents' quiet recollections as it is in great thundering concepts like immigration or feminism or modernism. When I was thinking about how to formulate this talk, I went looking for the histories that could tell us something more about all of this, and I found the excellent book, Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy, and Freedom in the Atlantic World by Jessica Marie Johnson, but I think it gets best at what I'm trying to say about Monage's work in another way. Johnson's work is primarily concerned with the black women in Louisiana and Senegal in the 18th century who secured a kind of freedom for themselves and their children through the machinations of intimacy. She writes, in a unique position to claim their own labor, free African women and women of African descent negotiated, challenged, and appropriated categories of difference. That provocative framing, negotiated, challenged, challenged, and appropriated categories of difference, makes me think immediately, of course, of Esther, the seamstress at the center of intimate apparel. Through her work, Esther is privy to a vast, the vast ramification of turn of the century in New York City. 
She's able to enter the boudoir of a bored, rich white woman, Mrs. Van Buren, and offer her the latest fashions. And these fashions are ones she finds in the rooms of the, of the um, whorehouse where she attends to her other client, Mamie, a black woman sex worker and passing friend. That white lady I talk about sometime, Esther tells Mamie, she keeps asking me what they'd be wearing up in the tenderloin, all that money and breeding, and she want what you're wearing. Only Esther, who moves through both worlds, can see the irony of the rich society woman mining the style of black sex workers and calling fashion a tale as old as time. Esther's mobility also brings her to the shop of Mr. Marx, a deeply observant Jewish fabric merchant with whom she shares a burgeoning intimacy. And finally, her hyper mobility brings her back to her own boarding house, to the uneasy companionship of the boarding house owner, who continually reminds Esther of her failure to find a husband. It's the self-perceived flaw that leads Esther to begin a relationship with George, a beige man who writes to her, begins writing to her from Panama. Never mind that Esther cannot read the letters themselves. They show her yet another world she could possibly enter, though she doesn't realize, till the end of the play, that that world was never real. Johnson, in her History of Black Women Intimacy, notes that the women she studied engaged in and were forced to engage in intimate relations across gender and race with individuals enslaved and free. They establish families beyond biological kin, kin and across race and status. Intimacy and kinship became key strategies in their bid for freedom and were central to how and what freedom looked like on a, on a quotidian, sorry, or everyday basis. This phenomenon is what makes intimate apparel such an appealing play. Through everyday acts, Esther forges for herself a makeshift community full of shifting alliances. It is the beautiful tragedy of the play, however, that by necessity, Esther must com compartmentalize all of these possible companions. She's made a family for herself in the city, but none of its members knows the others exist. Esther is the one continual thread, an expert at compartments compartmentalization until, until, in the play's climax, all of her worlds clash together and Esther's attempts at emotional separation fall apart. Part of the reason Esther is searching for community is because she is a woman apart. She's part of that first generation of black women in America, participants of the Great Migration, who arrived in cities in the North and Midwest and found themselves completely untethered from all the things that have defined a black woman's place in America up until that point. These women stepped wholesale into the modern age, a transition that must have been frightening. Before the Great Migration, excuse me, the vast majority of black women in America lived in the South were only slightly removed from slavery and were surrounded by the type of deep, complicated community ties that are necessary for rural living. Suddenly, in these big, glittering cities, these women no longer belong to land, or family, or a husband, or a mistress, or master. They only belong to themselves. A dizzying freedom that carried with it the edge of loneliness. I come here with nothing, Esther explains to her new husband, George. I slept in a cold church for nine days and picked up breadcrumbs thrown to, to pigeons. Esther is a woman of the modern age, but the knowledge the playwright is keen enough to know that even in freedom, perhaps especially in freedom, one yearns for true kinship, a meeting of the souls. In Esther's desperate romanticism, her persistent longing that George will become a true partner to her is because she is a free woman in the modern age that she wants George as an intimate friend as much as she longs for the status of wife. Esther, then, is like the women in Johnson's survey. Of those, of those women, Johnson says, they endowed free status with meaning through an active, aggressive, and sometimes unsuccessful intimate and kinship practice. In the world of Atlantic slavery that would go on to influence the experience of black life across the Americas for centuries, Johnson notes that intimate acts mated with, mated with edict, edicts, codes, and imperial jurisprudence to produce bodies of law like the 1685 Code Noir the first comprehensive slave code written in the, America, in the Americas. The Code Mora and edicts like it established partis sequitur veritum, meaning that the slave or free status of the child would fall out of the womb, harnessing and reproducing bodies to the expansions of slavery. Slave owners and imperial authorities reinforced slave codes with martial force, using shackles, whips, and arms forged and wielded by white and black laborers at the command of imperial officials to maintain and reproduce slave status. Free status also required the wounds and labor of black women and would be no less intimate or violent. Free status manifested in the interstices of manumission laws preoccupied with sex between European men and African women. Free status, manumission, and legalistic escapes from bondage did not free black women from these representations or protect them from the pre, pre, excuse me, predations of men and women who wielded them. 
Freedom gained definition when and as African women and women of African descent pushed back against their own enslavement and subject positions. African women and women of African descent who survived the horrific crossing can continue to turn to what was available, intimate and kinship ties, practicing freedom even when they could not call themselves free. They demanded freedom as a project of ecstatic black humanity in the face of abject subject, subjection and against slavery as social death. Um, so that was a lot, so let's sit with that for a moment. <laughs> for me, Johnson's research points to how my sense of freedom as a black woman is inherently tied to, the, to these senses of intimacy. The intimacy necessary to make ties with the white enslavers who would, through sexual or social bonds, come to see you as worthy of manumission. And it's a kind of intimacy that, by definition, cultivates a lack of emotional honesty and a rise of emotional compartmentalization in order to survive. That's the legacy we're dealing with as descendants of the world that enslavers and slaves made. Our very wounds determine the status of freedom for our offspring, and it's a bloody, awful mass that has taken, will continue to take generations to separate out. All of that mess is suddenly woven through Esther's relationships with the non-black characters in this play, Mr. Marx and Mrs. Buchanan. It is another bittersweet irony that Esther doesn't find emotional safety with the black woman around her. Mamie is a friend at first, but betrays her with George. And when Esther pleads with Mamie not to, Mamie replies, he's my man too. Mrs. Dickinson can only relate to Esther through condescending advice, a routine that Esther visibly chafes at, but that Mrs. Dickinson can't seem to bring herself to break. It's across the color line that Esther comes close to emotional intimacy and vulnerability. First, with Mrs. Buchanan, with whom she shares the secret of her liter literacy in the letters from George, and most poignantly with Mr. Marks, with whom Esther shares a mutual attraction. Notab notably, her relationship with Mr. Marks is the only one in the play where Esther has an upper hand. She's the buyer here, Marks the seller. With Mamie, Mrs. Buchanan, and Mrs. Dickinson, Esther is ostensibly the one selling, and the difference in power brings a surety to Esther's attempts at intimacy. It was, it's with Marks that we see Esther reach out for the touch she craves, even as she knows it is forbidden. Later, when the lonely Mrs. Buchanan kisses Esther, Esther pulls away in disgust, wounded by the overstepping of roles as much as she seems shocked by the kiss of a woman. Mrs. Buchanan attempts to point to their shared intimacies. Esther, she notes, is the closest she has to a confidant, but Esther is unmoved. It should be noted it is only because Esther and Mrs. Buchanan, and Mrs. Buchanan are in this mutated space of modernity that Esther is able to categorically refuse this white woman's desires and assert her own wishes. And it's also because of the strange space of the modern world that she finds herself standing behind Mr. Marx, brushing his shoulder in defiance of every ancient law of God that both of them know. The world that Esther finds herself in is a brave and scary one, the allegiances in it never quite making sense. When I think of Esther and where Nadia chooses, chooses to position her at her place end, alone again, forced to begin again, but with a child on the way, I think of Donna Haraway's musings on intimacy and kin and staying with the trouble, making kin in the chula scene. I'm going to totally murder that word. <laughs> Haraway is writing about a time still to come, so many post, 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 past modernism. But her words describe the wild uncertainty of Esther's life, too. She writes, kin is a wild category that all sorts of people do their best to domesticate. Making kin as odd kin rather than, or at least in addition to, god kin in genealogical and biogenetic family troubles important matters, like to whom one is actually responsible. Who lives and who dies, and how is this kinship rather than that one? What shape is this kinship? Where and whom does it do its lines connect and disconnect? And so what? What must be cut and what must be tied if multi-species flourishing on Earth, including human and other than human beings in kinship, are to have a chance? Intimacy and the space for it are integral to survival. That's what we've learned in part from Esther by the end of the play. And that's one of the threads through Nadish's work that's inspired so much of my own. have a discussion. Um, I just noticed that we're all BIPOC women honoring a BIPOC woman. And that's really, that's really amazing. Um, and so that brings me 
to my question that people rarely ask BIPOC women. How are you doing? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and that's usually our answer. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, each of you mentioned in various forms about freedom in some ways and about trying to address wounds um, that black women tend to encounter, have encountered. Um, and the, the role of the artist to redress those wounds. I've started to become to see um, Lynn Nottage as a sort of oral historian, the way she gathers information and the way she creates on stage. How, how is that, how is an, um, the role of the artist as an oral historian seminal to a creative work? makes me want to have another lunch and ask about your experience with this, but in my personal experience as a playwright, I have, um, like Lynn, inter done interviews as part of a creative process um, in different um, geographic spaces, in different cultural spaces, um, and with different historical themes. And one thing I have found um, and I wonder, Lynn, if you have found this too, is it's, it's one of the things I have loved so much about this path is that for a lot of the issues I was writing about at least, for example, the history of Puerto Rican men serving in the United States military, um, there weren't necessarily a lot of everyday spaces or opportunities to discuss their experiences in a frank and detailed and kind of straightforward manner. Um, I think a, a shorthand way to put it is this phrase, thank you for your service, uh, that a lot of um, service men and women have mixed feelings about. I heard on a, a podcast the other day someone say, because usually that's the end of a conversation as opposed to the beginning of a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so what I found interviewing um, Puerto Rican veterans was um, despite the fact that these were not topics they talked about in their families, in their most intimate spaces, Creating a frame that was simply like, hey, do you want to spend a few hours and, and talk to me about it? Just creating that frame and, and asking a question. Cre I, I had to do so little. They had so much to say. It wasn't actually about a shyness or um, a caginess. It was about just creating an appropriate, a space where it was an appropriate topic. Um, and so I think the, the oral historian, you know, and Lynn has, has gone to communities and done a tremendous amount of, of labor uh, to create, a, you know, a cultural record keeping. And I think it goes, there's a before step to kind of the after that we see, which is how these voices get funneled into a creative work or into her, for instance, her monument that she made in writing in Pennsylvania that um, last I heard was still continuing forward. Um, I feel like the first step to it is to creating uh, appropriate spaces for conversations that the, the greater the society at large hasn't created spaces for yet, necessarily. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful act of stewardship, I have found, that, um, I don't know, creates its fuel a little bit for, for an artist to keep going. So, We've talked about the black woman's body, her inner work, her intimacy, and we've each talked about intimate apparel. How does that work help to future, we have a lot of playwrights here, um, how does that work help future artists, help future black women tell more of their stories? 
going back to your previous question a little bit. No, no, um, I'm going to try to tie it together. Um, but I come from an arts background, but I am currently supposedly a scholar. And um, I think one of the things in, in the presence of artists, all of them, um, that uh, that strikes me the, the most in terms of thinking about the oral historian. And um, for artists, this is, I think, completely redundant and, and silly to say. But for scholars, I think it's hugely important for us to remember that it, we're actually talking about human beings. And sometimes I think we get caught up in theory and narratives and histories and you know the, the, the sort of the big pictures. And I think that the oral history is the thing that brings the, the artist and the scholar together um, in terms of grounding both in the stories of individual human beings. And to take on the next question, um, I think that um, Intimate Apparel, uh, like I said, was my first introduction to uh, Lynn Nottage's work, and it had a profound influence in many ways, but ultimately circled back you know, into the work that I'm doing now. And I think that um, the, the notion of not just intimate apparel, but the intimate lives of black women um, is, is the thing that, that moves forward, right, um, in terms of thinking of future artists, thinking of future scholars, thinking of future um, playwrights, uh, that as, as we've all kind of said previously, and you mentioned in, in your first question that we were all mute um, to answer, um, but that, that black women have intimate lives. Um, and sometimes that is, is washed away or overlooked or devalued. And um, so I think that the notion of not just intimate apparel, but black women and intimacy is the thing, and their intimate lives, their interior lives, um, is the thing that, that is the seed that, that grows out for me, and I hope for others for, for intimate apparel. Yeah, I would just add to that, like, I think one of the thing, one of the reasons why, uh, like, interior lives or emotional lives is, is so central to creating art is because it's a wild space, like, right? Like, there's no um, logic behind feeling, there's no saying about, I mean, we all feel like, oftentimes, so like we feel, we should feel some way about a certain situation or person, but then emotions take over. Um, and that's what often hap I mean, happens all throughout. Um, Lynn's work because she's a great dramatist is that um, the characters are living in sort of these very big ideas like war or um, modernism or, or um, great migration or sort of like these things that we can have like really big phrases to try and sum up. But the characters that are living within that are making decisions on a very personal level that are just following their own interior logic. And that's sort of the, the joy of, of, of reading her work and, and going through this work is seeing the tensions between the two. And I think um, you were sort of talking about like we have some people who are playwrights currently or interested in becoming playwrights or um, students as well because we're on a college campus. And I think oftentimes, just speaking from my own personal experience, when you begin writing, um, and especially if you are wanting to write about a marginalized identity, an identity that you feel like you don't see very often, early writers, um, to a T, usually get caught up in this idea that I have to write this character in a certain way because they should have this identity. And if I don't write them in this way, I'm going to get canceled or it's going to be untrue or whatever. But um, you know, that's not where the art lies. The art lies in actually writing the character as, as they truly could be, as a person, as an actor could inhabit them, as they could actually sort of be on the page. And that's oftentimes, um, uh, you know, that favorite word that we all love, they're oftentimes problematic. That's, so you have to kind of like walk straight towards that. You can't avoid that. That's what, where the art lies, that's where the drama lies, that's where the tension lies, that's where the actor gets what they're going to work with, that's where um, everybody comes together to make your play is going to be in that source of tension. Um, and it's really easy as a writer, especially when you're a beginning writer, to talk yourself out of that because it feels really complicated. 
I want to pivot to the audience really quickly. Um, and I just, we have time for maybe one question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, and I don't know if anyone has a burning question. Um, we're here for it. But if not, do you have a burning question? Yes, ma'am. So earlier, um, somebody had mentioned this idea of uh, feeling with your entire body. And so as folks who write, I'm curious from each of you how you all actually practice that. Like, what does that look like for you? Great question. <laughs> <laughs> so that was quoting Malima, who was listening with his entire body. And I think listening is, is part of that. Um, uh, it, the, for me, it makes me think of um, words that you both have said um, in your remarks, which is care and agency. Um, so, how how are how are we doing? You know, I, I try to always take good care. Um, sometimes being in a practice of wellness takes a little bit like more conscious steps in the day, and sometimes it feels more organic and more present for me. Um, and then this notion of agency, and I think really separating out for me um, as I'm listening with my whole body, mm -hmm. the difference between agency and control. So I try to give my work its own agency, but not control the work. And there's, it's, it's, a, fine, it's a fine balance. Um, there's times when control feels like part of it while I'm researching. Even sometimes while I'm daydreaming, I have this um, illusion that I'm in control. Because um, my mind is working in a somewhat like curatorial way. But all the, all the planning, all the outlining, all the, all the research in the world doesn't actually prepare me for what's going to happen in the writing act. Um, and the times when I can accept that and be present with that, it's the best times as a writer. It's, it feels amazing. Um, but then there's also times of resistance where I want to control the work. But the work is telling me, for instance, with the, a character's voice, I think about that a lot. You know, I do so much research about who, so much thinking, so much listening, so much walking about, you know, what is this character? What makes them tick? Who are they? Do they speak fast? Do they speak slow? Do they do that? But then when I go to write them, you know, they, they show me then. And, um, and so it's that, that care and, and agency uh, that is present for me. Um, I, would, I would just say, like, it's, as an artist, it's always a practice in, you know, in train yourself to f figure out when you are actually noticing something and when you are actually um, like becoming to be intrigued by something, which I think is really difficult, especially in our current sort of media environment where there's so, so just like an onslaught. You could just be surrounded by noise constantly if you so chose to be. Um, and it can be really difficult to figure out, am I actually interested in this topic or is it because there's 50 people saying this topic is super interesting right now and everybody has to talk about it right now. So um, one of the ways you can make that distinction for yourself as an artist is really training yourself to understand when it is that you're actually engaging with an idea from, from, your, from yourself, from your own personal um, taste, personal and personal, whatever the mixture cocktail is that inside your brain that's making you excited about something, figuring out when that happens, which I think means allowing yourself to be um, around and inspired by influences from everywhere. Like, we've been talking a lot about intimate apparel, but if you look at that play, you know, it's, it's very clearly structured around these ideas of um, different kinds of undergarments, different kinds of intimate apparel, right? So, like, just even thinking about that, like, if that's going to be your, your focus or interest, this, like, thing that doesn't seem like maybe it necessarily is going to connect with this other thing yet, but part of being an artist is that you are trusting that these obsessions that you have are going to somehow sort of connect and come together. And it can be really hard to trust that because the, it does not follow a timeline. You know, we are artists, we don't follow a productive timeline. We're not, it's not a nine to five. It's not like if I think about this for 40 hours, three months from now, it'll make sense. 
we don't, it's, there's no way to say that, you know, it could be that this thing that you're super obsessed with right now won't gain traction for 15 years. Um, and that's a very hard lesson to learn. <laughs> um, but that's part of, you know, the, what, what we do and what we make and how we make the things that, that we make that makes it different from um, creating in other sort of venues or other, or other ways. Um, I would add just very, very quickly that um, I think listening with your whole body has an incredible beauty, but kind of drawing off what you were just saying, there's, there's so much to listen to. Um, and I think that um, sometimes listening is, is about also determining what you're going to hear or discerning what you're going to hear and balancing um, the, the voices that, and the sounds and everything that you are listening to outside, but also all the stuff that you're listening to in your head. And personally, like most of my work starts lying in the floor, right? And, and trying to listen to the, the thing that, to find the, the quiet, to hear the thing that I want to actually pursue. Um, but I, I, yeah, almost every project I've ever worked on starts laying in the floor because that's where I find quiet. Thank you. Um, we have Lynn Nottage here. And so Lynn, if you would like to say a few words. I'll speak really quickly. I just want to say thank you so much to um, everyone who's sitting on this panel for those beautiful, eloquent words. And I learned so much about my own work. And it was a really surreal experience to hear my name said that often. And it made me consider whether I should change it. <laughs> but, but I just, from the bottom of my heart, I really thank you for taking the time to dig into the work and to be so deeply thoughtful. And it makes me want to revisit my own work, which is the highest compliment I can pay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Nottage. And thank you so much, panelists, Caitlin. So we have come to the conclusion of this symposium. However, there we meet back here again at 6 p.m. for more fun. Um, also, I just want to make an announcement that we have books um, in the lobby for purchase. Um, and I'm sure you guys would like to autograph them. Um, I'm offering words in their own mouths. Um, <laughs> but I want to thank you again um, for coming out to the Langston Hughes Festival and for celebrating Lynn and just celebrating 44 years. Um, we are so happy to see your faces and stay tuned for more. All right, have a great day.